people still have this stigma of kind of a something coming off a photocopier and stapled together. They go, that's a POD book. I'm going, there is not a person in the world that can tell the difference. This is Ron Pramschafer, and welcome to Publish Basics Radio, where weekly we try to help you navigate the self-publishing minefield. Now, Kirby, I've never seen so much confusion over a simple phrase, print on demand. Yes. Any idea where it originated, and how would you describe it? I don't have any idea. You know, we're not the largest user of print on demand. It really is um, most of the technology emulates out of the um, bank world printing statements. So I think... What happened was they had to print so fast, it just demanded the technology be developed, and then it migrated into the book world. Yeah. Wow. Because, see, the part of the confusion, like, I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, do you do POD? Yeah. You know, I say, do you mean do I do short-run printing? Yeah. And most of the time, they say, yeah. Well, that that's the sad part is, is I think, A, we keep trying to drive traditional models using new technology, and it's too bad that we don't kind of go, wait a second, and some have. Some have said, wait a second, we've got this new technology. How do we use it better than the old traditional method? Okay, so I see mostly print on demand. I see, I see you know, zillions of digital presses out there. Yeah. And can you produce a book? Yes. Yeah. Can you produce one book at a time? Technically, yes. <laughs> do they? Very, very, very few do. I mean, to me, right. print on demand means as needed, when you need it, one title at a time. Right. Okay, so with that said, how many true POD printers are there out there in the country? Oh, Ron, you actually... Um, You've hit on a, such a great topic because it's. Um, I was listening to one of our salespeople, and they were talking about um, we were the only ones to, to be able to really print one at a time. And this person corrected them, and the person was absolutely correct. Anybody can print one book at a time. The question is, can you scale it? Can you do it efficiently? And the bottom line is, of course, corporations have to make money. So can you make money at it? And, and when you looked at it under that light, we're one of the few that really can print one at a time. All right. Now, my understanding, the, the original idea was to allow publishers to bring out-of-print books back in print or to keep them in print. Yeah. That, where the quantity, yeah, where the... the they had a demand, but not enough of a demand to go back and print offset. Yeah. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense, okay, that you've got these books that are in these bibliographies all over the way, you know, the place and these college kids all searching. And, yep. you know, there's a demand, whether it's 100, 200, 500, there's a demand, you know, per year. Somewhere along the line, this changed. Yeah. And obviously, you still do the, you know, the old out of print. Yeah. Or, you know, keeping the backlist. Somewhere along the line, it switched to front list. Yes. POD has somehow switched from an innovative, great reputation printing method and evolved into a not-so-great publishing method as far as the, you know, the reputation. I mean, you, you know, they, they say that, you know, the distributors don't want POD books, bookstores don't really stock POD books, that, 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 that. I mean, what, I mean, do you see that from your end? Are you seeing it more as a printer or what? Well, I, I, I think there's a little bit of confusion in that, in that um, the, the true POD model is different. Because we can print and bind so fast, you don't need to have inventory if you can afford to wait a day or two to have it delivered or whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. and, and so it becomes very confusing where people say, I want to buy that book, but it's not there. Um, how do you buy a virtual book? Well, you put an order in, we print, bind it, and ship it. Mm -hmm. um, but people are confused with that one, and, and, and it's, it's a tough kind of sell. How do you get over that lump of selling something that isn't there? But the people who are smart about it now and are starting to go, wait a second, let's see. I get about 40% returns on my books or 60% returns on my paperback book. Mm -hmm. The numbers are huge. I'm keeping these in a warehouse. I'm paying for the warehouse. The guys in the warehouse knock them over occasionally. You know, some walk out the back door occasionally. Um, th this, I've got cash tied up sometimes for years in this inventory. Why not just print it when somebody needs it? Now, the flaw in that is if you are a believer that you've got to have it on a bookshelf to sell it, um, 
then people don't like it and they kind of go, oh, I've got to have physical inventory. And, and there's so many traditional models that we get wrapped up in. I paid the author a huge advance. That justifies a 50,000 printing. Let's print 50,000 or 500,000. And you kind of go, guys, why? Wait until you've sold it. Mm -hmm. We can print it and bind it and ship it faster than most people can pick it out of their warehouses. You know, yeah, I think the problem comes in more, not with the ones that are having, making choices of doing 500,000 books, but the ones that are making choices of doing 500 or 1,000 books. Generally, POD, you, you can't really afford to take returns right. because you're paying a higher, higher printing cost, which you should. You know, you're only buying one book at a time. Right. But it doesn't give you the same, you, you can't give the same discount structure and you can't really take the return. So it's, you know, is the store saying they can't get it because it's non-returnable? I mean, it half makes sense. Well, that, yeah. Now, now you're getting into retailers' issues where a lot of them don't want to carry books that don't have a returnability on it. Okay. Say you put a returnable. Yeah. You know, okay. A lot of, and I get a lot of feedback. A lot of people say, oh, well, we don't want to carry a POD book. Yeah. Okay. We won't order a POD book as if it's like a leper. Yeah. You know, and I don't know how, you know, we're making strides, I guess, in the right direction. But I don't see this changing. I mean, I see whole book, bookstore chains saying, you know, out now lying. Saying, I can't even get the book. I know. Well, Ron, I, 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 ten years ago, when you looked at a, 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 a book coming off a, uh, a digital printer then, it was not very good quality. Today, I could hand you an offset book and a digital book, a paperback book, straight black and white text. There's no way that you can tell the difference without an eyepiece, without a loop or a magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. Vis visibly, you cannot tell a difference. The binding is as good. The print quality is good. The paper is as good. The cover is good. In fact, Xerox is claiming that the covers are 15% better than offset today. Ah, oh, there we go. Go Xerox. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I mean, there's some neat things that are happening. But people still have this stigma of kind of a something coming off a photocopier and stapled together. They go, that's a POD book. I'm going, there is not a person in the world that can tell the difference that it doesn't have a loop or a uh, magnifying glass. But we still are stuck or painted with this old stigma of it's not as good quality. At all. Because one of the things now, again, I'm dying, I've been dying to ask you this question. Yeah. Okay. Everybody doesn't necessarily, I mean, you can't, the average person can't tell the difference between a POD book and an offset book. Not only can't tell the difference. And certainly not this clerk sitting in the bookstore. Yeah. Okay, so how do they know it's a POD book? Just because we always flagged it as a POD book. And you still do. If I go to Ingram iPage yep. and I, I look up a title, yep. it's got this giant logo for Lightning Source, uh, which even the stupidest clerk can say, oh, POD. Yeah. Ron, we're trying to get rid of that. <laughs> so, are you, are you forcing Ingram to put it in there? Well, I'm doing my best. <laughs> so, I, I mean, uh, it, it does nobody any good to be painted with this stigma of POD. I, I just it, it, those are some of the, you know, the book industry is very slow to change and very slow to accept new ideas and and. But you've got some major publishers out there that the light bulb has come on and they've gone wait. I can save a lot of money or wait, my warehouse is, you know, 150,000 square feet. I only need a 40,000 foot warehouse. Now, we're not saying you ever get rid of it, but you don't need 150,000 square feet if you start to put the titles in the POD program at the appropriate time. Okay. And the distribution channels or whatever, and I've spent a little time, you know, on your website. From what I understand, I send you a digital file. Correct. Okay. At that point, what happens? It sits in your hard drive until somehow magically you get an order. When you give us the title, we will put the uh, information for that title in as many digital catalogs around the world that we possibly can. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Baker and & Taylor, um, Ingram, obviously. And when that goes out, um, they get picked up by the different databases. So hopefully somebody goes to a Barnes & Noble or an Amazon and says, I want Ron's book. And if it is if it is Amazon, the order comes through Amazon to us, and uh, we will print and bind and ship the book. And um, that's how it works. Okay. But, but do you, I mean, so do you deal direct with, uh, with Amazon? 
let me be clear on the Amazon thing. If your book order comes through Amazon, Amazon can buy your book through Ingram or they can buy it directly from us. What they will try and do is consolidate freight. So if they decide that they're buying 16 other books, that it would be cheaper to buy the 15 or the 16 books from Ingram and buy the print-on-demand book through Ingram. We print it, bind it, and ship it over to Ingram. They put it all in the same box with those 16 books and ship it to Amazon. Okay, well, you ship direct from Amazon, don't you? Uh, we do not, no. Oh, Ingram, 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 Ingram ships direct. Yes, we do not. And that's why it might be beneficial sometimes, it all depends on discount structures, to go um, through Ingram rather than directly through us. Well, I tell people actually the if they deal with Amazon, because Amazon's always been good to the small publisher. Yep. But if you look at their program deal on direct, that advantage program, whatever they call it, yep. by the time you give them the steep discount and pay the shipping, you can't make any money. <laughs> I mean, it's the one time, like with, you know, strictly POD, yeah. that you can make more money going to uh, selling books through Amazon through this method than you can the traditional method. Right. You know, and that's normally not, not true with all, you know, other POD situations, but certainly with Amazon. Yeah. And I assume being N.com. Yeah. Now, how many oh, retail outlets? I, I see bannered about the Internet, you know, the access to 26,000 retail outlets or whatever. Is, is that basically people using your network? Yeah, I think so. I, oh. uh, is it really that many? Um, well, there are a lot of different, you know, we always in the book world, we think traditionally Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, orders, but we forget, that, you know, the dog food stores are huge on selling books and uh, the boutiques and little things that we don't think are traditional booksellers besides the independents. But there's probably that many that are um, uh, selling titles, selling books, mm -hmm. maybe not as their main business, but yeah. They're, they're okay, because one thing I know is very confusing. You go to Amazon. Here's this poor guy who just published his book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, he knows it's been published like for 24 hours. Yeah. He goes on, he finally sees his book there on Amazon. Yeah. And it's listed as 27 different sites as a used book, along with Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Now, am I right that none of those 27 sites even have a book? You are correct. Okay. The, well, how does it work? Everybody's waiting for somebody to push the button and pay the money. Uh, correct. Um don't confuse that with the used book market, but on the new books, um, if he's just put it up with us and it's finally gotten through to the Amazon site and somebody can see it, um, then if, if Amazon's the only um, retail channel that it's going through, then the only place you can order it from is Amazon. So the other people that are showing it uh, would have to order it through Amazon if that's what's been restricted. Okay. Yeah. Now, i got one last question for you. Am Amazon bought a company called Book Search. Correct. Right. That was all fairly recently. Yeah. Okay. Amazon is basically a retailer. Book Search is a printer. And they're a publisher, too. Yeah. Well, very important. Yes. They're a printer and a publisher. Okay. Where do you see, I, I, my personal crystal ball, see Amazon coming down one day and saying, if you want your books in Amazon, you small publishers, you're going to use our printer? Um. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. It, it, we are watching the whole situation very closely. Um, I, I'd love to have a magic ball. Yeah, no, I mean, I haven't seen any follow-up to it. I haven't even really seen anybody with, like, my same opinion. I mean, but then on the other hand... Oh, yeah. oh, Ron, I will tell you that there are lots of people that have your opinion. Oh, oh, great. There are some neat theories out there on what they could be doing or what they're cooking up. I don't know. They're a wonderful customer to us. We hope we'll, we'll continue to be a wonderful customer. You know, you, you, you want to look at what percentage of the marketplace they hold. Mm -hmm. And, and as a publisher, if you got forced into, um, just going with one retailer, you know, would you want a chance that you're going to limit the market size? Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I think Amazon, just like everybody overrates me on Oprah, yeah. I think people in general overrate me on Amazon. Yeah. You know, I, I see the figures every month, and it's not as high a percentage. I don't, you see them company-wise, I see them on a little smaller scale, but they're not nearly as large a percentage as what you would think. And I bet your, your percentages are a bang on what mine are. All right. Well, Kirby, it's been really good talking to you. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye. For Publishing Basics Radio, this is Ron Pramp Schaefer. See you next week.